Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> if I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, June 22nd, 2023. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Sharn Norris, author of Bodies Under Siege, how the far-right attack on reproductive rights went global. And later in the show, Sam Russick, reporter, researcher for The New Republic, will be with us to discuss Houston's mayoral race. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has ruled against the Navajo Nation on water rights and native treaty rights. Five to four, Gorsuch and liberals dissent. House Republicans censure Adam Schiff over uh, investigating Trump. They're going to keep doing this, by the way. This is their new tactic, censuring. Since, um... That's the Republican Party, I guess. Meanwhile, Lauren Boebert tries to impeach Biden over uh, the border. Much to the dismay of Kevin McCarthy. We'll probably get into that in the fun half. Because it was a busy day for Boebert. Because of that, she apparently got into a verbal fight with Marjorie Taylor Greene on the House floor. MTG called her a little bitch, apparently, which rocks. I mean... She's, she's become a attack dog for McCarthy. It's interesting how that works. Mm-hmm. AOC, Ilhan Omar, Cori Bush, Rashida Tlaib, Jamal Bowman. So far, the names that are boycotting far-right Indian leader Narendra Modi's speech to Congress. Biden, however, is rolling out the red carpet for the Hindu nationalist. Speaking of Modi... After branding himself as Twitter's free speech savior, Elon Musk has censored on Modi's behalf. We've covered that before. And now, totally coincidentally, they are meeting to discuss Tesla expansion in India. At least 35 migrants are feared dead by drowning off the coast of Spain. Stanford researchers find that cooking with gas stoves could be as bad for you as secondhand smoke. Good news, Atlanta's city clerk has approved the language of the referendum petition put forward by anti-cop city activists so they can move forward and potentially collect signatures to try to stop the construction. And lastly, the FTC sues Amazon over tricking people into continual Prime subscriptions. Lena Khan remains maybe the best part of the Biden administration. All this and more on today's majority report go ahead matt it's just myself and matt today so he's uh, doing a bunch of different things yeah. yeah i'd been wondering why i'd been seeing a whole bunch of advertisements from amazon saying hey are you on a uh, stamp or uh, medicaid uh you can get a deal on prime and yeah it's like oh you're trying to you're basically realizing that um if you get under any sort of congressional scrutiny, it's going to be helpful to say hey this isn't it, all just for rich people <laughs> yeah right right um good point uh, I know that there's, there's a lot of people in the ch in the what 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 is it called the IMs the IM machine. I believe that's the chat. Uh, there's also the IMs you looking at, but I never see those. Oh, so okay. That's well, just you and Sam have access to the. IM oh machine. well, I mean that's uh, that's the kind of tiered hierarchy exactly. that we like to have here. Um, I just stare up Mount Olympus, wondering <laughs> what's going on up there. So what's going on in that chat? Because we have some IMs wanting to know what my announcement is going to be. That's right. And I can't give it to you just yet going to be at the end of the show. This is called a tease. <laughs> Whoa. Um, this is called a tease. But yeah, it's going to be... Uh, Sam said 10 a.m. for tomorrow. Uh, actually, it's going to be more like 1 p.m. That'll be the tease. Um, 10 a.m. is a significant time. 
but it's not the time that's significant for the audience. Yeah, things change, it turns out. But uh, yeah, uh, we're, so we're going to announce this in the plug section. Yes, show, right so? at the end of the show. So like 1 p.m., you can tune in. We'll probably get to it. But don't turn off in the meantime. You've got to watch the whole thing. I'll know if you didn't watch. That's the thing. And I'll be really, really disappointed in you. Um, so, oh my gosh, uh, Richard Ryder wrote in a very, very... Uh, <laughs> inappropriate comment about Marjorie Taylor Greene that made me laugh, but I will not read it now. Let's talk a little bit more seriously about uh, what I headlined earlier. Indian PM Narendra Modi is in the United States today. Um, he was doing a yoga photo op and uh, trying to clean up his image for him. a U.S. audience. <laughs> yeah. <she> <laughs> <laughs> Missed opportunity. Uh, I know, right? Well, she's 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 honestly she's probably on her psyop mission. Right, she's like literally like yeah, parachuting into Somalia right now. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I mean, Modi, uh, we've covered him on the show before. He's a nationalist. He's a far right freak. He leads the BJP, which is the ruling party of India, and that is built on a foundation of uh, Hindu supremacist ideology. It's. Uh, a party that was born out of the RSS, which is a right-wing paramilitary group, and they've explicitly said that they're inspired by Nazis uh, and they want to do what Nazis did, except to Muslims. And Modi has presided over anti-Muslim actions in his time as prime minister. And even before that, when he was the chief mi minister of Gujarat, which is a state within India, he basically put this ideology into practice and um, played a role in allowing for the slaughter of thousands of Muslims within his state by like basically doing nothing and allowing it to happen. Um, and for his actions, he was banned from the United States for uh, well, like nine, ten years until he became the prime minister. He's an extremist, and the reason that the United States is cozying up to him now is because the Biden administration and all of Washington, frankly, is hyperventilating about a uh, of, about China supremacy. So they want to foster a relationship with the most populous nation on the planet, regardless of um, his extremist politics. Yeah, we're I, joining him to fight authoritarianism. <laughs> yeah, and I saw Lloyd Austin did some uh, uh, press conference where he said that there, uh, we know that India is committed to free commerce or something to that effect. Like oh, us, I mean, nice. well, <laughs> then that, <laughs> then I'm cool with this. Say no more. Uh, this is a segment from Mehdi Hassan's show uh, last year that I thought was really good, where he does a deep dive into the BJP, uh, Narendra Modi, the RSS, and explains, fleshes out a lot of uh, what I hinted at earlier. All good. Again, this is last year, but it, it helps uh, contextualize why the squad and others are uh, not attending the speech. ...is how politically successful they've been. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is a man in charge of leading a country of 1.4 billion people, almost four and a half times the US population. He's been re-elected as Prime Minister, and yet he was a longtime organizer in the RSS and is now head of the RSS's political party affiliate, the BJP. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Modi and his party, the BJP, were in charge of the state of Gujarat during the horrific 2002 riots there. For a second day, Hindu mobs attacked Muslims in towns across the western state of Gujarat. Despite uh, shoot-to-kill orders issued to police in one village, Hindus set fire to Muslim homes, killing 30 people. Witnesses say the police stood by and watched as crowds burned Muslim-owned stores, hotels, and restaurants. In one village, 27 Muslims died when angry mobs set their homes on fire. In another village, seven Muslims were burned to death in a bakery. It's estimated that between one to 2,000 people were killed in Gujarat, the vast majority of the Muslims. Many Muslim women were even raped. Western researchers have called it a one-sided systemic pogrom backed by the BJP. Human rights groups, both Indian and international, also say Modi and his local government were complicit. Some even say the riots might have been premeditated. Even the US government seemed to recognize Modi's culpability at the time, banning him from coming to the United States. 
until, of course, he became prime minister in 2014. And then, well, we were pretty much buddies again. Barack Obama even wrote Modi's 2015 Time 100 article calling him a reformer in chief. If Obama mainstreamed Modi and everything he represented, Trump took him to the altar and tied the knot, marrying the far right politics of the world's two biggest democracies. Here in Houston, Texas, thousands attended the 2019 Howdy Modi rally, AKA the Trump Modi Love Fest. I present to you my friend, a friend of India, a great American president, Mr. Donald Trump. Prime Minister Modi is doing a truly exceptional job for India and for all of the Indian people. <laughs> for all of the Indian people? For all of them? Since his coming into office, since Modi came into office, hate crimes against minorities skyrocketed from Dalits to Christians and most of all towards Muslims. Lynchings. Yeah, lynchings of Muslims rumored to have eaten or even transported cows, a holy animal for Hindus. Muslims being hacked to death while their attackers chant anti-Muslim slogans. Extremist priests calling for the rape of Muslim women. As the BBC put it last year, unprovoked attacks on Muslims by Hindu mobs have become routine in India, but they seem to evoke little condemnation from the government. This Modi government is complicit in all of this. Last week, authorities in Delhi took nine bulldozers through a city and destroyed parts of a mosque while people were inside and raised dozens of homes and commercial buildings, most belonging to Muslims. Modi's government also claims almost two million Muslims whose families originally came from Bangladesh generations ago aren't rightful citizens of India. And if they can't prove they are, they'll be sent to what the government calls transit camps. So that was a little long, but I thought, as always, <laughs> Mehdi Hassan just doing God's work uh, on mainstream media. Um, and it gives you a sense of why the squad is boycotting. Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar are the only two Muslim women in Congress. They have said that they won't be attending the speech. Then AOC made the announcement. Uh, Cory Bush, Jamal Bowman as well. Jamie Raskin won't be going, but I, I, I didn't. I realized it was not like a principled thing. He's going to his daughter's wedding. So I mean, like you could have you could have done a two for Jamie Raskin and just said both. But I mean. Curiously, this was in the nation. Ro Khanna will be in attendance. And look, I'm not trying to pick on Ro Khanna. I know I've, I've mentioned now a million times that he did that thousands of dollars a plate dinner with David Sachs fundraising uh, for his campaign mm -hmm. multiple times. I've met Ro Khanna. He's been lovely to me, but that's not what this is about. That's this the is problem is Ro like presents well and has some good positions. Yeah. So when he does things like, yeah, uh, hang out with Jeffrey Sachs and take his money and um, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, stuff and this, it's like uh, y y y y we can't like just be like buddy, buddy. <laughs> right. And and I, we have to call this out because this to me, this seems very concerted. I mean, this this is... It's not an issue where can act like he hasn't, uh, you know, had a better position than even before. Right. I mean, and, and also let's put into context that he was one of the signatories on the, like, stop the evils of communism BS that a lot of members of the progressive caucus and the, and the squad who, you know, we hold, we expected to, uh, didn't join because... I missed that. I was in Mexico. I didn't know he... I knew, like, oh, wow. Yeah. That and the David Sachs thing and then this. The... Uh, piece is written by Diksha uh, Udupa saying, why does Ro Khanna want Modi to address Congress? We can scroll down a little bit here. Um, or honestly, you don't need to keep it on the screen. I'll just read it. Uh, Representatives Ro Khanna and Michael Waltz, co-chairs of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus on India and Indian Americans, secured Modi's address by writing a letter to House Speaker McCarthy urging him to invite the prime minister. Khanna's role in Congress's celebration of Modi disappointed many human rights advocates and supporters. The Indian American Muslim Council called on Khanna, who represents a district in the Bay Area, to rescind his letter, explaining that allowing the prime minister to speak before Congress would help to legitimize Modi's brand of Hindu nationalist politics and the systemic persecution of religious minorities, particularly Muslims and Christians, under his rule. 
In 2019, Khanna called for the reject for rejecting Hindu nationalism, tweeting, it's the duty of every American politician of Hindu faith to stand for pluralism, reject uh, hin- hindu- uh, hindu- hindutva. Hindutva, I'm not hindutva, sure. Yeah. yeah, that's the ideology of Hindu nationalism, basically. Um, and speak for equal rights for Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Christians. Now, four years later, he has helped secure Modi's address to Congress. Khanna has publicly condemned uh, Hindutva, a Hindu supremacist movement, but his congressional campaigns have also received more than $110,000 from individuals associated with Hindu nationalist groups since 2011. When I asked about his decision to advocate for Modi's presence at Congress, Khanna reaffirmed the Biden administration's perspective of, quote, India as a strategic ally to the United States. Again, this is really about trying to uh, form a relationship as a way to make India less neutral in the rivalry between China yeah, and the United it, States. Yeah, it's a world power rivalry. Like, I am typically okay with diplomacy, even with regimes uh, um, like that we don't agree with on lots of these things because the world is a bad place. But to do it specifically toward an end of, like, creating a block <laughs> of geopolitical rivals, like, you do it because you want to create peace and, uh, and that sort of thing. You don't do it because you're trying to uh, get in front of China. Um, He told me, uh, this is the reporter speaking, the quote is, I believe any elected prime minister of India at this moment from whatever party should be afforded the honor of addressing Congress, meeting the president and a state dinner. I don't think it's about the person as much as it is about the office. It's about respecting the nation of India. I find it interesting and curious, given Ro Khanna's constituency, that he makes this claim. Um, He represents Silicon Valley. And I was reading the New York Times write-up about this visit and how semiconductors are going to be something that's on the agenda for Biden and Narendra Modi. Another thing that's important in terms of the rivalry with China. Right. Last part I'll read from this piece here. Modi visits, Modi's visit comes amid state persecution of religious minorities such as Muslims and Christians as well as growing authoritarianism of Modi's ruling BJP. Hindu religious extremists have called for genocide against Indian Muslims, attacked mosques and churches, and demolished homes. You saw that earlier. The Biden administration has been largely silent on these issues, choosing to try to strengthen the U.S.-India relationship and deepen the ties between the country's military and technology sectors. With Modi's visit, for instance, Washington has been pushing Delhi to sign off on a military deal for dozens of U.S.-made armed drones. And how will those drones be used is the question. I also just want to point out that when you saw that video of Trump and Modi, there's also a sub, um, uh, a, 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 a sub, what am I trying to think of, theme here, mm-hmm. which is a battle for the votes of the Indian diaspora in the United States. Um, and people... Like, you'll see right-wingers from India who will, you know, send me tweets angrily when we comment about, say, you know, uh, the the connections between Tulsi Gabbard and Hindu nationalism, whatever. Yeah. Um, they'll point out that Modi is very popular. <laughs> well, sure. But that's because he's per- persecuting a minority. A minority <laughs> of people. So, majoritarianism doesn't mean that they're right. Um, and I think that's important to point out. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break, but first a word from one of our sponsors here, a sponsor that I use on a nightly basis because I have their dang comforter and it's amazing. Cozy Earth. We have teamed up with Cozy Earth and they're Earth and they're offering you up to 40% off to go to CozyEarth.com slash majority and enter majority at checkout, and then you can get their incredible products. Simply swap out your current sheets for soft, breathable, temperature-regulating sheets from Cozy Earth, the brand that's made Oprah's favorite things five years in a row. If you don't agree uh, that you're sleeping cooler, more comfortably this summer, they will refund your purchase price, plus shipping, no questions asked. I sleep hot. I'm a bad sleeper. It's a, been a problem with me since I was like a kid, honestly. And this comforter, I don't have the sheets, but I have the comforter. I'm in the market for new sheets. I should get some um, from Cozy Earth using this. But they, they it really is. It, it's a game changer. Um, you get 100 nights to try them out before uh, the, the refund opportunity runs out. That's right. 100 nights. How can uh, Cozy Earth make such a guarantee? 
because their bedding is made from viscous, from bamboo, so it traps less heat, enabling people to sleep cooler, more comfortably, year round. Um, Cozy Earth's luxury bedding and loungewear, that loungewear, I've got to cop that too, transforms lives by offering the softest, most luxurious, and responsibly sourced products in the world. They start with selecting only the best suppliers with an eye towards quality, responsible production, cutting-edge technology, and premium materials. So for a limited time, save up to 40%. That's 4T. That's a big, big amount on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash majority and enter majority at checkout to save up to 40% now. Try them for 100 nights. If you don't sleep cooler, send them back for a full refund. That is CozyEarth.com slash majority. Again, I use it. I really can speak to their quality. It's helped me a lot in my, uh, like my, you know, no, not really any more uh, sleep sweats. I have the, uh, not to be a little too weird about it, but like you I wake do, up and you're swimming. I, uh, yeah, and it's annoying because then you're like, ugh, I feel sticky and and, and gross. I gotta move to the side. So yeah, I mean, like, I'm my bed real estate. Uh, well, I mean, it's not that bad. <laughs> But it really has Maybe I'm helped. I'm describing my own problem. <laughs> uh, you could use Co- Cozy Earth. You could go to cozyearth.com slash majority, save up to 40%. Again, cozyearth.com slash majority and enter majority at checkout. All right, guys, taking a quick break and we're going to, uh, we'll be back in a second. Bye. <laughs> back and we are joined now by sean norris journalist and author of bodies under siege how the far right attack on reproductive rights went global uh sean thank you so much for coming on today thank you for having me it's great to be here for, for sure so i mean you've been reporting on threats to a- abortion for some time at this point as a journalist um just i guess from your perspective and i i, I are you over there in the uk uh is yes, that that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what was it like uh, for you as a journalist covering this stuff and for people around you to see the overturning of Roe v. Wade and abortion as a fundamental right in this country um, from across the pond, as they say? So I think a lot of people in the UK were very shocked. Um, you know, there's a sort of complacency around abortion rights in, in as you say, on this side of the pond, partly because you know, we have a very different cultural context to America when it comes to these anti-gender, anti-rights movements. We're more likely to see sort of anti-LGBT activism than anti-abortion activism. And so for a lot of people, it was a real shock. They weren't expecting Roe to be overruled. Perhaps they hadn't, you know, really engaged with the leak or they thought, oh, it's just kind of, this is something that can't happen. Trump is out of power, Biden's in, Biden's pro-choice. It won't happen now. But because I've been researching this book and doing journalism on this subject for a long time, it didn't come as a surprise. I was, you know, devastated and I was really shocked. But I knew from looking at the networks and the way in which this sort of anti-gender, anti-abortion right was putting its people into power, funding different anti-abortion movements, that it was becoming an inevitability that Roe would go. And I think in some ways in the UK, it's shocked us out of that complacency. But just last week, a woman was sentenced to 28 months in prison for having an abortion outside the exemptions of our current abortion laws. And that's been another real wake up call to pro-choice, pro-human rights people in the UK about how we can't ever be complacent about abortion. I mean, that is, 
a, a shocking story to hear, uh, but I guess not so shocking given what you lay out in your book. I mean, you mentioned how maybe anti-LGBTQ extremism or activism is something you're more likely to expect uh, in the UK, but um, these things are all connected. Um, and, and just in Europe in general, can you expand on that notion of how uh, interwoven anti-LGBTQ hate is with the efforts to restrict abortion and even prosecute abortions? So I think what we're seeing in Europe, and we are actually seeing this, as you will definitely know, in America, that anti-gender, anti-human rights movements are looking at different issues in different countries and seeing where they can be most effective. So there are some countries in Europe where there's sort of been big moves against abortion rights. Um, if we look at, you know, Poland being the obvious example where abortion is banned in almost all circumstances, we've seen, you know, really big attacks on women's rights and women's human human rights and humanity. In other countries in Europe, there's been a bigger swell of anti-LGBT activism, and that's been the case in the UK of late. We've seen a lot of anti-trans activism, a lot of anti-drag queen activism. But the the sort of the push in the, from these movements are coming from the same places. We can look at the sort of different organizations, the different influences, the different networks who are looking at both anti-abortion rights and anti-LGBT rights and working out where they can be most effective. And I think particularly one of the things that we've been seeing a lot of is sort of cultural issues, anti-woke issues that are coming out of the US and becoming more influential across Europe. That's not to say that Europe isn't, you know, got its own anti-human rights <laughs> movements that are, you know, working really hard to roll back progress. But I think if we look at the moment, the sort of anti-trans stuff, the anti-drag queen stuff, we can see how that is was fermenting in the US far right and has now become very, very potent in the UK far right. In terms of abortion rights, we can see how anti-abortion organizations in the US are becoming increasingly active and vocal in Europe where they think it's going to work for them. And so it's really a matter of kind of keeping an eye on these trends, keeping an eye on which organizations and influence are pushing these messages and where they are doing it in order to try and counter those narratives and to protect human rights. I, I want to get into the, some of the groups and how they're spending in Europe in a second, but I just wanted to flesh this out because it's interesting how your perspective is, I guess, different from mine domestically in the US that I felt the turfism was a bit imported here, you know, and uh, and and then now I guess the drag show stuff is being exported as well. I mean, it, that that's that was my perspective, but I it I guess it, it differs from yours and and your research on this. I mean, again, I think it depends on on different aspects of this, all those different aspects of the same horrible row, if that makes right. sense. We know that particularly I've just been looking at the drag queen stuff recently and we saw a lot of anti-drag activism from the Proud Boys, for example, sort of um, US conspiracy theorists such as Alec Jones pushing like anti-drag, you know, really nasty, uh, transphobic, homophobic messages. And we're now seeing that being picked up by the UK far right. In terms of the sort of, and the gender critical feminist angle, I think there's been a lot more crossover between the UK and the US. So again, it's those sort of different pressure points and those, those areas of attack and who's doing them. But I think it's important to understand that when we're looking at these anti-rights and anti-gender movements, we're seeing a lot of kind of cross-border networking. And it's not necessarily the sort of old threats that we had from the far right in the past, where you maybe you had specific groups with specific leaders, because of social media, because of the sort of networked environment of the internet, different narratives get spread and picked up in different places. Different influences can push out these narratives in their international telegram networks or you know, YouTube channels. And so there's a real kind of cross germination of these mm. anti-right networks and anti-right messaging. You you write about how a lot of the uh, billionaires and the funders of anti-abortion activism in the United States have been making investments in Europe. Um, do you mind highlighting some of those examples for our audience? So there's been loads of really amazing research on this issue. And whenever I talk about it, I absolutely have to credit Neil Data, who's a researcher based in Brussels, who put together an incredible report called Tipping the Iceberg, which was my Bible when I was looking at funding as part of the book. Um, obviously, I had to do my own research as well, but it was a really important piece of work that he did in order to help us understand how funding streams work, 
in the anti-gender movement in Europe. And the sort of the big funders of anti-gender activism in Europe will be names that I'm sure are familiar to your audience. We've got Alliance Defending Freedom that has set up hubs in, in Europe, in Vienna, in London, um, and who are spending increasing amounts in the UK, which is actually quite concerning for sort of pro-abortion, pro-LGBT activists here. We're seeing them becoming increasingly active and vocal and mainstreamed in the UK. They've been cited in government reports. Other organizations, the DeVos Foundation, obviously linked to Betsy DeVos, who was mm. Trump's education secretary, organizations such as, you know, Koch Foundation money, and also the Prince Foundation, the DeVos, you know, Betsy DeVos's parents. So, and the other one is the Billy Graham Foundation, which is kind of quite difficult to track their spending because of their tax status in, in the US. But um, I think it's really, important that we understand how US organizations are exporting both money and tactics to Europe and also to the global south, while also recognizing that European activists and foundations are doing the work themselves. You know, it's I, when I spoke to Neil, we talked about how people like to sort of blame everything on the US. It's like, oh, we'd all be nicely progressive in Europe if it wasn't for these organizations. But there is a sort of homegrown anti-gender movement in Europe at the same time. Right. And, and um, you, you highlight some of those examples, right? How, like, say, the, the ADF was uh, helping out in the gay cake uh, case, I think, in, in um, I forget which country in that Belfast. was in, in Belfast, um, and that they helped restrict abortion in, in, in um, other areas of Europe, like Poland, for example. Uh, but the, the parts that I really was just so f darkly fascinated by was when you did these deep dives into the intersection of some of these other conspiracy theories on these online forums and how mm. these great replacement theory um, related conspiracy theories are at the heart of this kind of new age um, anti-abortion movement that is both like within Europe and the United States and, and in the global South, um, as you describe. So this was really the reason I wanted to write this book and the kind of driving force behind the book. I wanted to look at abortion and anti-abortion movements out of the sort of religious context where I think we've been quite familiar of talking about anti-abortion activism and putting it into that political context, looking at how the far right is weaponizing abortion in order to pursue its aims. And what I was finding when I was looking at, you know, really extremist, far right, neo-fascist, nationalist spaces was this continued repetition of the great replacement conspiracy theory and how that relates to abortion. So I'm sure, again, most of your listeners will be more than familiar with this, but great replacement is the completely baseless idea that people from the global north are being replaced by migrant people from the global south and that this is being aided by feminists who are pushing abortion rights and contraception. And in order to combat this, in order to combat what they call white genocide, they need to have white women having lots of white babies for the, the nation and the race. And this is kind of epitomized in this idea put out by some far right activists of the white baby challenge, that white women should be having three, four, five, six children in order to, you know, stymie replacement. And it was really like a shock to me because before this, I like many people, I sort of thought about abortion as a kind of something that was concerns of Catholic people or evangel evangelical churches. But actually, when you look at how the far right looks at abortion, it's very, very deeply embedded in white male supremacy and white male supremacist ideology and aims. And once you recognize that, it becomes, you know, a much sort of more urgent political issue because we're seeing more and more far right, hard right, authoritarian politicians using the language of replacement introducing natalist policies that either ban or restrict abortion or try and incentivize the right ethnic women, be that, you know, the American, white American women, the white European women to have more babies. And also links into the kind of historic and continuing um, sterilization mm -hmm. or violence, reproductive violence against black and global majority women. And so li linking the anti-abortion movement to those kind of far right conspiracies and seeing how the far right uses abortion as part of its agenda, I think it's becoming more and more urgent. Well, it's incredibly important given um, 
declining levels of religiosity in the mm. United States, but also globally, really, um, for the right to be able to be flexible on this and still implement their uh, far right agenda. And, and Tucker Carlson for, you know, is one of the most vile people in the country, but he's been at the mm. forefront of pushing this kind of notion of natalism. Um, and it's going to tie into eco fascism as well. Mm. This kind of privileging of uh, white female uh, or uh, cis female uteruses uh, and in conjunction with discussions about, you know, Africa's way too overpopulated, you know, like that kind of stuff that it, it, it actually fits together quite nicely for a very terrifying vision of the world. Yes. And I mean, Tucker Carlson, it's very strange from a UK perspective to watch him on television because we have different regulations on TV media and the stuff that he says he just would not get away with saying in, on UK news. I mean, it's really bizarre. But um, he was very pro-Hungary and Orban and talked a lot about Orban's policies, um, such as the Family Protection Programme, which is designed to incentivize certain types of families in Hungary to have more children, while also, you know, Orban mm. has taken a very strong anti-migrant, anti-LGBT agenda. And this was being cheered on by people like Tucker Carlson and also people who were close to Trump, who sort of saw the Orban example as something that they would be interested in, in implementing in the States. Do you mind if I just inter um, interject really quickly? Because I yeah, just think yeah. that example is so fascinating because there were tax incentives included where it would incentivize people to have children if they were straight. Um, it would also mm. incentivize women to stay in the home. Uh, I'm forgetting mm. the exact specifics of it, but it was like a significant financial incentive for the woman in the family not to work. While at the same time, the the tax uh, proposal being entirely exclusionary for LGBTQ people, um, and and this is the kind of vision that someone like Tucker Carlson and, and like really the Bannonite right, which is the through line for all of this, has for the world. Yes, and I think it's really important to understand this, and it's it's true against the sort of Tucker Carlson Bannonite side. It's true in the sort of Orban policy and other um, European nations that have been copycatting this policy, but also in the kind of anti-gender networks that are putting these proposals in front of governments. They are all very, very concerned with removing women from the public sphere and returning women to the domestic sphere. And you do that by presenting women as subordinate or inferior to men, saying that patriarchal authority is the most important thing for in terms of women's status you know, banning abortion so that women don't have control over their own reproductive freedoms and, you know, pushing back against protections from domestic abuse, which is another goal of lots of far right organisations. So that women become, you know, they have less economic independence, they have less social security, they don't have, they don't occupy the public space in the way that feminism has allowed women to do for the past hundred or so years. And so we're really seeing that attempt to roll back progress on women's rights that is very much centered on abortion because without control over your body, without control over your reproductive freedoms, you can't ever have, you know, full equality and full liberation. Yeah, it's it's uh, women are uh, either a godly vessel uh, for male control or they are a vessel for the nation. They are the womb of the nation, right? I mean, this is really old school fascist kind of stuff, but it's just repackaged for a modern context. And um, I'm curious how the the rise in nationalism in really response to like, say, you know, EU membership within Europe has played into some of um, these very scary <laughs> developments that you that you uh, research in your book. So it's a complicated question as ever with the European Union and uh, different countries' relationships with it. Um, I think what we've been seeing is a sort of continuing divide in Europe, which will be familiar to people in the States as well, of this kind of what we think of as like pro-European or, you know, metropolitan, international, um, pro-LGBT rights, pro-women's rights. And this is kind of associated with the European Union despite the fact that that is in itself debatable. It's not like the European Union is, is some kind of paradise of human rights, but it does protect a lot of human rights. Um, and then that's kind of contrasted to this sort of traditionalist, perhaps more religious, perhaps more conservative 
beliefs that things were better in the past, like we need to be sort of looking inwards rather than looking outwards, and that these kind of ideas about LGBT rights and women's rights are being imposed upon our countries by the European Union, which is sort of seen as this kind of supranational enemy to the nation state and, and, and sovereignty. Sovereignty was the big word that was used in the UK during the Brexit referendum when we, you know, left the European Union. And so I think there's this kind of battle going on between generally, you know, younger people who want to be in Europe, who want to promote LGBT rights, who believe in human rights and women's rights, and this more parochial nationalist feeling that the EU is imposing an, ide an unwanted ideology on the nation state. And, you know, I think, I mean, in some ways, because Brexit has been such a, I mean, a, let's, let's call it what it is, a disaster, mm. um, that's kind of lessened the anti-EU feeling in some parts of Europe, because nobody really wants to copy our example. Um, but you do still get this kind of whenever something goes wrong or whenever people want to push against a kind of progressive agenda, the EU is sort of seen as the bogeyman in that respect. Yeah, I mean, it. it, it is, uh, it's a bit like trite, I guess, to blame fascism on globalization, but without when you're unable to understand that, I think that you're missing a piece of the puzzle, even if the reaction is completely unjustified. It, it just is, it is a part of what we need to reckon with, I think, when we're trying to actually combat some of these far right uh, proclivities. Yes. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people were left behind or felt left behind more accurately by this, by globalism, you know, and, and I think particularly after the 2008 financial crash, which is something I discussed towards the end of the book, there was this sense that all the old certainties, the promises that were made, had broken apart and that people no longer had a narrative to make sense of, of what was going on. And when these kinds of things happen, when people lose um, a sense of, you know, of feeling part of something or feeling that there's a narrative that makes sense about the economy, about politics, about where we are as a society, it's really easy then for far right and fascist ideologies to sneak in and say, go back to the old certainties, you know, the old certainties, a nation of, of race, of war. The, the, if you feel hard done by, it's because this woman has been promoted over you or because you can't get a girlfriend or because mm. migrant people are coming in and getting housing that your friend hasn't got a house. And rather than looking at these kind of structures, you know, what governments are doing, what what people who actually have real embodied power are doing, it's so easy to turn to the person next to you and go, you're the problem, you're the enemy, and I'm gonna react against you. And I think the far right has been very successful at weaponizing that and weaponizing the sort of breaking apart of the old narratives of the last 30 or 40 years and, and sort of jumping in with their own narratives that are really harmful. Well said. Um, Sean Norris, journalist, author of Bodies Under Siege, how the uh, far right attack on reproductive rights went global. We will put a link to your book wherever you're listening to this or watching this or on uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. For sure. Um, all right, guys, quick break. When we come back, uh, we're going to be talking about Houston's mayoral race. <laughs>
We are back and we are joined now by Sam Russick, reporter researcher for The New Republic, whose piece is called Houston's Mayoral Race is Exposing the Left's Fault Lines. It's really fascinating. Uh, Sam, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, happy to be here. So um, this was a really interesting piece because it pits a more conservative kind of democratic coalition versus a more liberal at least nominally kind of democrat and, and, and in many ways uh democratic uh incumbent who's i believe being term limited out but that kind of still um coalition as well and the and unions within uh within texas and within houston and they're kind of more al- aligned with the conservative front runner here which is something that you wouldn't expect from the outside but your piece does a great job of of kind of fleshing it, fleshing it out um so but let's just i guess start from the beginning about who the players are here for our audience um the current mayor of houston and the conservative democrat who is the front runner to uh to to become the mayor after him who are these guys Okay, so I think it's helpful to start first with uh, John Whitmire. Uh, He has been in uh, the state legislature since around uh, 1972. Uh, He actually won his first election when he was in college still. Um, And he stayed in the sort of state, uh, you know, as a representative for around a decade before making the jump to the Senate, um, where he has stayed uh, since 82. So, you know, going on 40 years now. He's the dean of the Senate. he uh, sort of ran as a more, uh, I believe, progressive uh, candidate uh, at the time, uh, way back when. Um, but uh, he was a very ineffective uh, legislator. Uh, you know, uh, Texas Monthly actually, uh, when he sort of came around the curve in the 90s, uh, said that, you know, before then he'd just kind of been a class clown. Um, and uh, it wasn't until 1993 when he rewrote, uh, pretty much completely overhauled the uh, the penal code, uh, the prison system, essentially, uh, when he really became uh, sort of a household name, and the, like the dean of the Senate, um, which is in itself a kind of interesting way of thinking about the trajectory of the Texas Democratic Party. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know this, but... Uh, Theodore Roosevelt had, you know, a four to one, uh, you know, support among people of Texas um, in uh, a couple of his runs. Uh, There was very strong support for him in the party, uh, a lot of union support, um, and there was a lot of union activity in Texas. Um, But that sort of gave way after the 60s uh, and the sort of rise of, you know, I'm sure your viewers are uh, you know, uh, aware of uh, neoliberalism and, you know, the sort of austerity politics that took hold around then. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Democrats held the majority in Texas from the Civil War basically all the way up uh, to the 90s, um, which is a very long time, but it led to a crisis in the party because they didn't really know where to turn after the New Deal era kind of uh, collapsed in on itself. Uh, so, uh, Whitmire and other Democrats sort of staked their claim on uh, along similar lines as Bill Clinton uh, as sort of tough on crime, uh, you know, uh, punitive politicians. Um, and, and that's exactly what Whitmire did. Uh, when he rewrote the penal code uh, in 1993, uh, you can look at it, uh, the Prison Policy Institute. Uh, there's like a graph from the 80s up into, you know, the where we are now uh in 1993 it's almost a straight line um (laughs) the uh the prison population more than doubled uh in just five years wow um and uh he did that by making more uh you know uh making sure that violent criminals uh had to serve at least 50 percent of their sentence before they were eligible for any kind of parole and uh totally removed good behavior from nonviolent offender crimes. So, you know, if you're in prison and you were caught with, you know, weed or something like that, uh, you could be held in prison for, you know, however long, uh, no matter how good you were in prison, you know, no matter, you know, what was going on there. Um, but, uh, you know, that didn't really work. Uh, the sort of rightward tack that the party took uh, still led to the rise of the Republican Party. Um, 
But because of his sort of tough on crime credentials, he has sort of maintained his status. Um, I'll get back to sort of the rest of that story, how he's uh, pivoted uh, later. But uh, Mayor Turner uh, was also uh, in the state uh, legislature for a long time uh, before he sort of came back to uh, Houston and ran for the mayoral spot. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, you can look back uh, at a lot of the coverage then and see that, you know, he was sort of uh, uh, marketed as this working, you know, he was originally working class. He was from the Acre Homes neighborhood, which is like a poor sort of black part of town. Um, and uh, uh, they marketed him as a working class progressive, uh, which when you hear that, you know, you think, you know, maybe, maybe he would be able to sort of implement some good stuff. Um, and, you know, his record has shown, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, kind of the opposite of that. He has sort of maintained uh, the status quo, uh, the sort of new Democrat line after Bill Clinton, say. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of progressives were disappointed with him. Um, he sort of lagged on uh, workers' protections. Um, he did, uh, he repeatedly, you know, delayed these affordable housing projects. He actually got sued by uh, Obama's housing and urban development uh which is sure. interesting because they, uh, uh, Houston, I believe, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but mm -hmm. had received uh, HUD grants to implement that um, Housing First policy that was quite successful for its 10-year run from 2011 to 2021. Right. Uh, that policy is still going. And I actually have another article about that that I wrote a while back. Um, it, it's a successful policy, to be sure. It gets a lot of people housed. Um, what, what I found uh, through sort of my research is uh, the problem with housing in Texas just generally is that there are very few tenant protections. So in Houston, where it's relatively affordable to live, um, you can uh, sort of, what they do is, you know, they partner with landlords and they're like, hey, you know, uh, if we pay, you know, so-and-so amount of the rent, like, will you take these uh you know, homeless people in. And they do that like all across the city, primarily in poorer part of town, parts of town. But, uh, you know, what, what ends up happening is uh, sometimes those landlords are not the best. Uh, mm. And, you know, they get moved into pretty, you know, can I, can I swear on the show or? Yeah, um, you know, go pretty, for it. Yeah, pretty, pretty shitty housing. Uh, I, I talked to this woman who, you know, she moved into this place and there were just rats all over the place. And uh, I, there was another woman who was in a car wreck before she became homeless and they put her on a second story apartment. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a mixed bag, but it has been overall successful, I would say. Um, but yeah, uh, he, he has gotten support for housing first policies and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, when COVID came around, uh, while other cities like Austin and Dallas were sort of initiating their own eviction moratorium, because in a state like Texas, judges just decided to avoid or, you know, uh, ignore the CDCs, um, he decided not to. Like, he just waited to see what the state would do, hoping that the state would come in with a, a moratorium. And if you know anything yeah, about sure. Greg Abbott, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So before he did anything, more than 15,000 people were evicted. Uh, I, I talked to a woman at the time who, you know, she was at work, uh, at, I, I don't remember where she was working, but she went to the hospital with COVID and, you know, had the you know, tube on and everything. And when she came back home, you know, she's, she's walking home from the hospital finally, and there's an eviction notice on her door. And, and it was just stuff like that over and over again. So uh, that, that felt like a failure to a lot of progressives. Uh, it, you'll notice that like a lot of the unions that endorsed him in 2015, when he initially ran, uh, did not endorse him um, in 2019, because it, it felt like a betrayal. Yeah. Um, yeah, go yeah, on. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm, no, it's OK. I mean, and, and that, I guess, brings uh, us to kind of where we're at now, which was uh, a big focus of your piece. The fact that the m the very conservative, tough on crime uh, Democrat Whitmire that you highlighted, who's in his 70s, he's been in the in state government since he was in college and the uh, outgoing mayor uh, Turner are on like very different sides of 
this uh, dispute essentially over arbitration between firefighters and the city and the AFL-CIO has endorsed the more conservative Democrat here, Whitmire, in a fairly crowded field. So this is just a unique kind of coalition fracture that you don't necessarily see. I'm, I'm wondering if you could expand on it. Yeah, so uh, Whitmire, he got the endorsement of the AFL-CIO, uh, but he also has the endorsement of a bunch of you know Republican mega donors. Uh, Tillman Fertitta, actually the owner of the Houston Rockets, uh, sort of held the event where he announced his campaign and the AFL-CIO was there. He's gotten money from the Teamsters, uh, but, you know, also, you know, uh, Mattress Mac, who's this kind of uh, local character, uh, sells mattresses, but he's also very uh, much, uh, you know, a Trump supporter. Uh, yeah. Uh, and what, what's interesting about it is the fact that Whitmire was sort of able to outflank uh, Turner as a sort of progressive candidate uh, on this issue in particular. Uh, to talk a little bit more about the firefighter union uh, and the sort of uh, issue that was going on there. Um, basically, in 2003, voters, uh, the Houston voters, through a proposition, uh, agreed to allow uh, the Houston firefighters to negotiate, uh, finally, you know, um, their union and they didn't have even the right to negotiate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and they still don't have the right to strike. Uh, public employees in Texas don't have that. You have that in other areas. But I mean, just just to give you a sense of what, right, they're, right. what they have to work with here. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a long and sort of protracted struggle that they are going through. Um, I, when my source joined the uh, firefighters in 2016, uh, the average wage for cadets was uh, around twenty eight, twenty nine thousand dollars a year, which coincidentally, if you just you know fast forward to where we are now, uh, Houston is starting their own sort of uh, universal basic income uh, pilot program, and that's the cutoff. Uh, if you make twenty nine thousand dollars a year, if you're a firefighter at this point in time, you qualified for uh, people who are two hundred percent below the poverty line, um, and. You know, so in around 2017, they go to the mayor and they demand uh, increased wage, uh, as unions do. Um, but that, uh, as I understand it, uh, there were sort of two factors there. Uh, there's one that has to do with like budgeting, you know, the same sort of stuff you hear from a CEO, like we don't have the money for it. Um, and there's another thread where uh, a lot of people I talked to are like, you know, um, the uh, firefighters union, they can be a little bit abrasive um, when they when it comes to their demands. Um, and uh, Mayor Turner, uh, you know, uh, the quote I have in the piece is he's a little thin skinned. You know, uh, he, he uh, took it personally when they made such strong demands uh, to him. Um, and so he just kind of refused to negotiate. Um, as a lot of, you know, similar to, you know, star, the former Starbucks CEO, he kind of like made his own concessions on his own and was like, you know, over the course of so and so years, like you're going to get, you know, 6% raises every other, you know, year. Um, and uh, so where we are today, uh, the firefighters had it got an 18% raise total. But uh, that wasn't really what they were asking for. Like, it's still on the mayor's terms, which is a problem when it comes to collective bargaining and things like that. So that's where the firefighters sort of, uh, that's where that came in. Uh, Whitmire's bill, uh, what he was trying to do is mandate that the mayor must negotiate with the, uh, with the union. Uh, that's, that's the mandatory arbitration bit. Basically, like, you know, uh, there is a representative from the union camp, a representative from the city camp, and a neutral party, and they have to come to a deal. That's the bill. Um, and uh, sort of surprisingly, when that happened, a lot of liberals were upset. They were like, Whitmire is already messing with the budget. Um, he is, you know, 
enacting decrees in, in similar ways that Republicans have that have affected our elections, that have taken control of our school board, uh, that have you know done all these other things. It, it kind of grouped in with him because he's a conservative Democrat. But what the bill does is actually fairly progressive. Um, so there's this weird push and pull um, that, that uh, makes the race a little bit more complicated. Yeah, and, and we'll just uh, kind of wrapping wrapping things up here. I mean, that's what's interesting is the fact that the left in Houston and in Texas, maybe more broadly, uh, although it's a huge state, so I can't make wide generalizations. But what you highlight is that the liberal coalition like does not seem to be married in the way that other cities, other more like progressive municipalities are to labor and this fracture is being exploited by a more conservative democrat who is on their side i mean i think it's also notable that he is white whitmire uh versus the the current mayor who is black um and the firefighters uh, you, you quote in your piece that they're stereotypically associated with being trump supporters and that is not necessarily making um the best case for broader leftist rep uh, leadership within Houston. Right. Yeah. I, I think um, uh, my, my source, the rank and file firefighter, uh, he sort of said it best when he said that, you know, the fact that there isn't a left candidate who really lobbied for union support and could also lobby to, you know, the different interest groups that make up the progressive coalition is a failure on the, uh, Houston uh, left's part, um, you know, I, I think it comes down to a lot of different things. Like uh, the uh, liberals in uh, Houston will tell you that it's mainly a budgeting issue. Uh, there was a sort of regressive austerity tax placed on property taxes, uh, which makes it uh, very hard for the city to sort of raise money in order to, you know, keep parks and roads paid and you know clean and uh if they give so and so amount of money to the firefighters then that sort of messes everything up in the budget and you know parks will go you know untended to and, and things like that um but i i think uh what my source my firefighter source was sort of telling me is like we need to sort of expand the scope of, of what our government is capable of doing and you know, giving unions more power uh, in order to negotiate with the mayor and uh, helping to build labor power in the city will help us repeal things like that austerity tax and help us to uh, get funding for more things and, uh, you know, tax people more equitably and things like right. that. As opposed to pitting people against each other, which is, you know, uh, that's that's what conservative politics really sometimes boils down to. Um Sam Rusick, uh, the piece in The New Republic is entitled Houston's mayoral race is exposing the left's fault lines. We'll be monitoring this race for sure um, in the lead up to it. Really appreciate your time today, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Bye. All right, guys, going to wrap up the first hour of this program, head into the fun half. But first, I have to give my big announcement. I'm seeing a lot of speculation seeing am i pregnant no am i going to be a the great imagination am i going to be the general manager of a sports team no i mean that would be a significant pay raise for me uh honestly kind of dream job uh, nice just do scouting of prospects all day <laughs> oh my god are you kidding me dur devil says emma your secret's out you're actually a pair of twins olsen style alternating which one shows up for work each day i mean that would did be you nice hear too. some woman did some women did that no there were two women and they were literally like um the same guy yeah. like married to the same guy and like they were like taking turns being single and being married to i them. mean love it um love that for them but the real announcement is that tomorrow at 1 p.m i'm filming it at 10 a.m it's pre-recorded i will be on tim pool's program culture war um, he and i have to definitely debate that's what i love <laughs> wait did you have that teed up what uh, we, we added that yesterday uh, okay, wait say it again do it again <laughs> he and i have to definitely debate that's what i love <laughs>
Who is that? That's Donald Trump. Oh, okay. Well, it sounds very out of breath. Anyway, um, I am going to be on, yes, Culture War with Tim Pool. Um, there's going to be another guest, this guy named Sh- Sean Fitzgerald, a.k.a. Actual Justice Warrior. I found out about this yesterday. The uh, um, David Horowitz Freedom Foundation. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So it's... I guess the two of them, and then I'll be on as well. I didn't yeah. realize it was pre-recorded. That's why Sam said 10 a.m. yesterday, but it will be on 1 p.m. tomorrow. So I'm flying out tonight, doing the show. <laughs> it's going to be a good time. I hope well, everyone tunes in. What can you in. do with this information? <laughs> yeah. What Whether can- or not it's true is not what matters. Yeah. Though it does play a role. And the role it plays is that it is true and Emma will be there. <laughs> <laughs> the role it plays is that uh, you guys should definitely tune in and it'll be very fun. Um, so thanks to uh, Lance from the Surfs who kind of made that connection for us. Uh, and now, yeah, we'll see. I'm not sure exactly what we'll be talking about, but it's... Uh, How scary the cities are, I think. Maybe. Maybe. I'm sure. Um, all right, guys. That is the announcement. So... Fun go. times. I know a, a couple people guessed it. Credit to you if you were able to guess it. I think like some people were saying it's going to be Jordan Peterson. I would welcome that as well, but I think he's a little too afraid. Um, so, so it also like I don't know. It's one thing, <laughs> and, and actually quite a lot to go to Tim Pool's compound. But wherever Jordan Peterson would invite you to, like, I, oh yeah, I mean, welcome to the garden. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to like find like an old timey Victorian dress even to enter. It's like an eyes wide shut situation. Um, do we have uh, Brandon and oh, yes. Binder? As Matt brings them in, I will say, check out youtube.com slash ESPN show. We spoke about Bradley Beal uh, being traded to the Suns. We spoke about the drama surrounding Stefan Diggs, what it means for the Super Bowl window for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, Dwayne Wade and his unwavering support of his trans daughter. I saw. I tried to watch that and YouTube uh, blocked something. I know, I know. I got to clip it and like just take the video element out, I think. But it was still good and you guys can can uh, see the the interview as well. I mean, if the media if the media actually was a positive influence and not like, you know, still the descendant of the sort of like slave catching classifieds and stuff yeah. like that that it was in the 19th century, like it would be showing uh, models like Dwayne Wade as a father to yes. a trans kid instead of like, you know, Matt Walsh, uh, you know, going to speak at a school board under false pretenses. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and... Uh, Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, yeah, Left Reckoning, uh, we got a great discussion on coming up on this Sunday with Brian Box Brown. He has a great comic. It, first of all, people recognize him. We've had him on to talk about weed legalization, stuff like that. He's a comic book artist, and he wrote a, uh, a comic about the He-Man action figure in the 80s. And at first, I'm like, Brian, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like uh, superhero movies. Like, this is not really my thing. But I looked at it, and it was actually really deep. Um, it goes back all the way to Bernays and the propaganda mm. and sort of uh, manufacturing consent and into the history of advertising to children and how, uh, oh, Star Wars happened. Realized, like, there's some money to be made, and Reagan's <laughs> like, let's let kids play with violent toys uh, and market. And so now we have Pixar making Toy Story because, like, ooh, that's right. going to be really good for uh, selling toys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah. Uh, that great. Flame and Hot movie is, like, in the other recent we, that's the other thing is film. We, we didn't quite, we did make the point of, like, oh, that Pixar, like, Cars is not up to Pixar snuff. No. But you sell, you sell action figures with it. Yeah. Um, but now we're making, like, movies about, Products. Products. Air was about the... Yeah, like, I don't really care about the creation of the Air Jordan. I care more about the Michael Jordan of it all. Yeah, um, I'd rather watch <laughs> that documentary again um, where Same. he lies about what was happened in the flu game. But um, anyways... Ooh, I didn't uh, realize that was a lie. I mean, he was hungover. Uh, <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning for that, folks. All right. Um, now we have our friends, Matt Binder and Brandon Sutton, and the secret has been revealed. I'm going on Tim Pool's show tomorrow. That is the announcement. Oh, wow. Yes. Yo. Why? <laughs> I love it. Trying to do more of this kind of stuff. I mean, there's like only so many ways to expand uh, yourself in like this professional sphere, and doing that is one of them. Yeah. I think you Don't should only talk about laptop. his music. Okay, I will bring my laptop, yes. And bring a skateboard. 
I don't have a skateboard. Got... <laughs> Can I at, call my mom and see if my Razor scooter is still in storage? <laughs> yeah, check, you should definitely check for that. That's that's one of the uh, highlights of the uh, Tim Pool compound. I the know. Skate well, you park in his basement. You uh, you you would know, right? I mean, to, uh, skate parks are cool, but like, I mean, Rob Deerdeck had this. Like, oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, ben I walk Margera, past the skate park thing. every day on my way yeah. to work. There's like a few of them in the in the city here. But um, anyway, guys, uh, what Brandon? What's happening over on the discourse? We should have a new episode out for you soon. You can check my Twitter. I'll post it there. Uh, pretty bad lefty at twitter.com. Uh, Matt Binder, what's happening on Doomed and Scam Economy? Sure. Uh, got a Scam Economy episode in the works. That'll be out soon. So, uh, you know, check out scameconomy.com. And uh, this week I had on on Doomed at youtube.com slash Matt Binder and soon up at doomedcast.com. Uh, Dan Gilbert, a.k.a. The Bad Stats, uh, on Twitter. Mm. And we basically uh, broke down, uh, you know, RFK Jr.'s, uh, viral appearance on Joe Rogan <laughs> show. Uh, wow. We talked about all the misinformation, disinformation uh, that came out there. And then the uh, whole hullabaloo that happened online afterwards about uh, Peter Hotez uh, debating on Joe, uh, RFK Jr. on Joe Rogan show and how Elon Musk got involved with that. And, you know, we sort of discussed the... Uh, the broader sort of IDW uh, idea behind uh, the debate me bro culture among these guys who literally refuse to debate anyone who actually would challenge them. Um, mm. So yeah, check that episode out. Yeah. Right. I mean, th this whole conversation, like I I'm not, we, you'll never find me saying like the whole no platforming thing. Like, and I, I do think you do need to uh, give them argument as Ben Burgess says, but like we cannot, Except this framing that oh actually people are just afraid to debate yeah. them like these actually what happens is the actual discussion to be had is does the left need to be more polite and cordial to get on these platforms and I would say um, I don't know that that's necessarily the result I think like well like I mean just speaking to what I'm doing tomorrow credit to Tim he's having me on he's known that we've we've like mocked him a few times on the show and mm -hmm. like commented on his stuff. But like that's a known adversarial kind of thing, and it's also not the nature of scientific debate, which yeah. is like there is no debate here. It would be one thing if our if uh, Hotez was debating another scientist who had done like rigorous methodology and was within still like some sort of consensus in the scientific community, not a conspiracy theorist who he's had combative a combative relationship and also with for like years. this idea that like hotez himself said like i will go on joe rogan you'll go on your show and describe this to you but like rogan needs to have a second there to attack him with and instead of just going at like oh this is an expert i just talked to different experts yeah but he's picked a side here yeah and when you have rfk on and you, you and you can't just talk to hotez yourself it's because he has an actual or in this fight and joe rogan is an absolute coward because i know people who have been on that show and they were told that joe Rogan doesn't want to talk about the COVID stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. Instead, just talked about the trans stuff. Yeah. Why did he tell that guest uh, that he doesn't want to talk about it anymore? And now all of a sudden he really wants to talk about it and actually make a, a big thing of it. It's because he's a coward. That too. So yeah. like that, that like these sort of thing. And also like, I do think it's good that Tim Pools has you on his show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he should. <laughs> no, I mean, I said, I, I've said the same thing. Like, you know, listen, all these people we disagree with, uh, we have strong opinions about them, but I think, um, you know, you are, I, I view you in a, a different light or in a different way, not based on your opinion, but I view you in a different light if you're at least willing to engage with other people. And, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I've been on Tim Pool's show and I give him props for uh, talking with people like me and Emma and Lance of the Surfs, but at the same time, it's a bit weird. Uh, Tim still won't talk with Sam, but that's yes. a whole nother story for another day. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're just going to like politely like brush under for a little bit. Well, <laughs> uh, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 boy is back. I'm the
the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a whoa, what, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare. Nightmare. Bring back nightmare. 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 nightmare! Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflake says what? 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 A hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, hell, 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 <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. My birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. Black. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I am a We are back. We are back in the fun half. I am turning off the voicemail. You can call into the phone lines at 646-257-3920. Um, lots of IMs about this. Is this <laughs> thing on? Emma, have you adequately prepared for going to Tim Pool's show by rewatching all the Marvel movies? <laughs> I, I gotta say, can't say that I have. Um, Star Fox, Emma and crew, can the Discord... Get a birthday show far for our member series business. He is knowledgeable, hilarious, and incredibly kind. Um, and is truly a part of the heart and soul of the community. We love you, bud. Nothing, nobody beats the biz. I'll give you a... Because, again, we're... There we go. Matt's better than me. It's just... Uh, we don't. Bradley's not in today either, so it's a little shorthanded. We can't get to the soundboard. Uh, Emma, Mark did did um did uh did they ask you specifically to do the culture war show instead of Tim Cast IRL? 
Uh, we found out fairly. I don't remember when we found out it was the Culture War show. Um, okay. Yeah. I was well, just wondering, know. like, if he's gonna start promoting that one more, and that's like you having you on is one of his ways of doing it. Because I remember he announced that a couple of months ago when he said he was gonna like use the other channels differently, and then it sort of fell wayside. He forgot about the show for a bit. It seems. Oh, him, interesting. Him starting a new show called The Culture War is like us starting a new show called like The Social Security and History Report. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bit redundant um, well the difference is uh at least the, again i don't know if he's still doing it but the difference when they first launched it was on the culture war show instead of sitting in those computer chairs around that desk they sat in beanie bag chairs or whatever it's called the be the bean bag right. chairs <laughs> and talk about the same shit <laughs> does he change his hat for that one is it like a red is it like a red uh beanie <laughs> as opposed to like a black one I'm, i mean we're, i'm gonna have to see um uh left his breast to me it feels like tim and others like him are motivated to bring on people like emma because it provides cover for the other 98 percent of their broadcast the debate happens how it will but 100 percent of the time without fail these grifters just lie about what happened anytime they reference it until their audience is completely forgets what happened it would be one thing if these grifters invited people on and were honest about the events going forward but that undercuts their grift and business model um mark monkey emma have fun with sean he once told lance that black people are less likely to use condoms uh, because they didn't know how he okay well that is good to know i'm going to <laughs> is write this that the david and... horowitz freedom uh, Foundation <laughs> yes the, the actual yes. justice warrior who was born in 1990 yes Interesting. um micah from utah 